Good morning, everyone. Uh, the warmth of God's house. What a wonder to be here, right? Amen. Our call to worship today comes from Psalm 89. I will sing of the Lord's great love forever. I will declare that your love stands firm forever. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Blessed are those who have learned to acclaim you. And that's what we're here for this morning, right? To give our praises and acclaim our Lord Jesus Christ and our God and to walk in the light of his presence. I invite you to rejoice and sing. Worship together with O Worship the King. It's number 73 if you're in your hymnal. It'll be on the screen for you as well. One, two, four, and five are the verses. <laughs> o Worship the King, all glorious above, how gratefully sing God's power and His love, our shield and defender, the ancient of days, pavilioned in splendor and girded with praise. O oh, tell of his might, O oh, sing of his grace, whose robe is the light, whose canopy space, his chariots of wrath, the deep thunder clouds form, and dark is his path on the wings of the storm. Verse 4. Thy bountiful care, what tongue can recite? It breathes in the air, it shines in the night. Thy mercies how tender, how In sweetly distance in the dew and the rain. Frail children of God and feeble as frail, in thee do we trust, nor find thee to fail. Thy mercies, how tender, how firm to the end. Our maker, defender, redeemer, and friend. O oh, gracious God, we come together to worship you again this morning. You are mighty in power and perfect in holiness. Your mercy is amazing, and your patience is almost endless. We approach your throne this morning in prayer and worship through the merits of Jesus Christ our Lord, who forgives us our sins and cleanses us from unrighteousness as we open our hearts for your Spirit's purifying work. This morning we pray that our burdens would be lifted as we bring them to Jesus, who invited us to cast our cares upon him. And we humbly pray that our joy would be increased as we open ourselves to the workings of your Holy Spirit, for one of his fruits is joy. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Morgan is our reader this morning, and she's going to come and read from the second chapter of the book of Acts. It's a great chapter for us to be in today. <clears throat> Mm-hmm. 
I'll be reading from Acts chapter 2, verses 14 through 21, and verses 38 through 42. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd, Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men in, will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out um, my spirit on, in, these, in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the, day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. 38 through 42. Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children, and all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words he warned them, and he pleaded them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who are accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 added to the number this, that day. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. It's always amazing to read from the story of Pentecost, isn't it? All right, now it's Joanne's turn with Power Pack. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see you all here today. Well, I was thinking about what, what, uh, what I really want you to remember, especially the younger members. And I thought of this. Well, let's suppose that you know someone who's having a hard time. Maybe they lost someone that they love. Maybe they're not sure if that person went to heaven. And so maybe they ask you, well, how do we know for sure that we're going to heaven? So how would you answer them? And you might think, well, what if I leave something important out? What, what do I really need to say so that they can find Jesus? Well, I thought of an easy way for you to remember, and there's just four words, God, people, Jesus, and faith. Can you say those after me? God, God, people, people Jesus, Jesus faith. faith. That's it, those four words. So I'm going to explain a little bit more about each one of those words. First of all, God. God loves you. And he wants to know each one of us personally. He has a wonderful plan for your life. But what keeps us from knowing God? Well, people, we are stubborn Hmm. And we want to do things our way. And instead of following God's way, we think our way is better. Or maybe we just, we know it's right, but we just don't want to. And that's called sin. And our, our, every one of us have sinned. So we have a, a slide to show you a little diagram that will help you to remember this. So up here we have God, okay? And here we are people. And there's this big gap between us and what separates us is sin well we may think that we can reach God by trying to live a good life or maybe being religious going to church every day all of these ways that we try to reach God we never can quite make it no matter how hard we try we will never be as good as God right we're not perfect so we'll never be able to reach his level of goodness but there is one way to bridge that gap. You know what it is? Jesus. Jesus. Let's see the next slide. And we see that Jesus reached down and bridged that gap for us. 
Jesus is the only way to find God. Well, how is that? Well, the Bible says that God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son so that we who believe in him will not perish, will not die, but have eternal life. Jesus died in our place to take the punishment for our sins. He had a perfect life. He never did anything wrong, but he died for our sins so that we could have forgiveness and eternal life. Then God raised him from the dead. Well, you know, it's not enough to just know about Jesus. All of us here know, we know Jesus died, right? We know all of that, and that's not really enough. There's one more step, and that's the last word. God, people, Jesus, faith. faith. Okay, so Jesus reaches down to us when he died on the cross for us, and we have to reach up to him. That's called faith. Faith means trust. It means that we're trusting in not what we feel or think, but we're trusting in what Jesus did for us. That's the only way to know God personally and to experience his love and his plan for us. So if we ask God to forgive us our sins and we receive Jesus into our life, he comes and stays with us forever. And he helps us to become what he wants us to be. He will be with us forever. So what I've been telling you is all in this little book. It's called, Would You Like to Know God Personally? And there are some copies on the piano. I need to bring more, but if those are all gone, feel free to take them. They're free. And if you don't get one, let me know, and I'll give you as many as you want. I've, my brother gives these out. My brother leaves them in, in bathrooms and restaurants. He leaves them everywhere. He, I've given him probably, I don't know, a couple hundred maybe he's given out. So these are great because it explains everything here, and you can give this to the person that wants to know about Jesus. Everything I said is in here. And at the back of the booklet is this little prayer that you can help them pray. So I'm going to read it to you. And if you've never prayed this prayer, maybe you say, oh, yeah, I believe in Jesus. I come to church every week, but you've never really prayed this prayer. Then you can pray it in your hearts as I say it. Here it is. Lord Jesus, I want to know you personally. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. I open the door of my life and receive you as my Savior and Lord. Thank you for forgiving me of all my sin and giving me eternal life. Take control of the throne of my life. Make me the kind of person you want me to be. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. That's very simple. That's all we have to know to have our sins forgiven and to know that Jesus is in our life. So what are the four words again? God, people, Jesus, faith. Let's say it one more time. God, people, Jesus, faith. You got it. All right, so pick up your booklets today, and then you can share this with someone else. Thank you, Joanne. Wasn't that a great, simple way to think about the gospel? Uh, yeah, very, very simple, very usable. You can draw it on a napkin at the restaurant if you need to. <clears throat> Our chorus is Let Us Sing, another of Joanne's great choruses. Let us sing unto the Lord, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Oh, come, let us sing unto the Lord, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving, with thanksgiving, and make a joyful noise. And 
to him with songs. <clears throat> oh, come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us sing unto the Lord, let us sing unto the Lord, let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before His presence with thanksgiving, with thanksgiving, and make a joyful noise. It's a beautiful verse, isn't it? It's from Psalm 95. Now let's go to prayer together. I invite you to, to uh, bring your requests during the time as to when it helps us to meditate in prayer. Great and merciful Father, lover of all your creation, we bless your holy name today. You offer us forgiveness and new beginnings through Jesus Christ our Lord. You guide us into paths that lead to abundant life. You supply our daily needs so generously. We give you praise. We also thank you again for the freedom to worship that we enjoy and for health and strength to take advantage of that freedom. This morning we pray for many who are experiencing difficult times and need a special touch from you. We continue to pray for Carol Gladden Nielsen and her family as they mourn for her daughter Lori whose service was last week. Thank you that Carol can be here today. And we just pray for her and her extended family May your comfort be with them. May the promises of eternal life continue to comfort them and strengthen them day by day. We continue to support Harrison Griffin with our prayers. May your healing touch be upon him and may the doctors have wisdom to know how to bring healing to him. Father, we pray for your touch upon him. Our Heavenly Father, we continue prayers for the world around us. We pray for parents. Please guide them in this complex age where children are subject to so many influences. Help the parents in teaching their children the ways of biblical wisdom. We pray for our school systems as well. Please give godly wisdom to teachers and administrators as they choose curriculum. May they choose curriculum that honors you and may they teach it in ways that promotes right living and practical wisdom. Father, we pray for 
our local church in this time of transition between pastors. Please help us in managing the emotions that go with change and planning well for a smooth transition to our new pastor. Please continue to bless Reverend Gia Lynn Hall as she concludes her duties at Bakerville and prepares to assume the pastorate at Copper Hill in North Canton. We pray that there would be a rising tide of excitement as we anticipate what God has in mind to accomplish through her ministry here. We continue our prayers for the country of Ukraine, where the suffering of thousands has been compounded by the intentional breaching of a dam by the aggressor. Oh God, we pray that you would drive back the aggressor. We pray that you would drive back the forces of wickedness and pride and greed that bring about war and sustain it. And we pray that you would comfort the suffering and the grieving on all sides. We pray for a just resolution to the conflict. And may the war not expand any further. May the kingdom of Jesus advance even during this time of adversity. Oh Lord, there are others who are on our hearts to pray for today. And we pray for them even now and lift them up in our prayers and name them to you. Lord, as we name those that are on our hearts today, we pray for them. May they sense your loving care. May they look up to you in faith and receive help. May they grow in grace. May they think about you today. Thank you, Lord. Now please hear our prayers as we pray together as Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <clears throat>
a message of promise that comes down to us today and is crucial for us still this morning. A message that relates to God's eternal purpose for you and me today. When the crowd asked Peter how they should respond to the message, he admonished, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. That includes you and me today who have been called to follow Jesus. So the promise of the Holy Spirit is for us today as well. And with the same simple conditions, which Joanne was explaining, repent, believe, and Peter mentions baptism, which means publicly confess your faith in Christ. So during his ministry, Jesus preached, if you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? And then remember that Jesus visited the disciples in the upper room after his resurrection, and on one of those times he blessed them, and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. In fact, it says he breathed on them. And, and said, receive the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Jesus was putting into action the pending promise which the prophet Joel had spoken, the sending of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. And every sending of the Holy Spirit into our lives since then is the fulfillment of the awesome blessing of Jesus upon his disciples. Paul assures us that every Christian who has opened their heart to Jesus and acknowledges Jesus as their Savior and Lord has the Holy Spirit inside. In fact, Paul says, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. Romans 8, 9. But we are definitely not done receiving when we are saved. Our whole Christian life is to be lived in an attitude of receptivity to God's Spirit. We are to be seeking more of God's Spirit as we go along. Now, theologians are always discussing whether we receive more of God's Spirit or God's Spirit gets more of us. But I think it's both. But Paul's admonition is simple. He says, and the literal translation is this, be being filled with the Spirit. Ephesians 5.18. But there's one more thing about the Holy Spirit's filling that Peter wanted his audience to know, and it's extremely important for us today as well. Peter reminds his audience that the prophet Joel had made it clear that the coming of the Holy Spirit would be without discrimination as to gender or age. Note the repeated mention of women in the quote from Joel. It's repeated twice. Now this emphasis is not from Peter, it's actually from the original prophecy in the, in the book of Joel. That's part of what makes it so unusual. But why did Peter quote it? Well, the scripture evidence is that the women were present in the upper room. And it's likely that they also then were on the streets witnessing on Pentecost morning, speaking in different tongues, and part of the crowd that was witnessing in all those languages to those that were there. And so Peter needed to explain that wasn't normal in Jewish culture. And that's what Peter was doing. <clears throat> Peter needed to say that, remember, the prophecy included women. In a wider sense, Jesus had included women in his ministry in a way that other rabbis had not. In John chapter 4, the woman at the well became the first evangelist for Jesus. Jesus met Mary Magdalene at his tomb and made her the first witness to the resurrection. Did you ever stop to think about that? Mary and Martha and their brother Lazarus were Jesus' friends. Luke 8 specifically tells us that some women disciples actually traveled with the group of disciples, including two who were women of means who helped support the group. Joanna, the wife of Chusa, the manager of Herod's household, and Susanna. So the ministry of Jesus was open to women 
in a way that was not at all the norm for Judaism of the day. So theologically, we also need to remember that women being subject to men was not part of the original creation. Rather, it was part of the curse. Do you remember that? It was part of the curse which followed the fall of humankind into the sin. In Jesus, the effects of the curse are being done away with. And this began to happen in the ministry of Jesus. And it will be completed when he comes again and completely eliminates the last enemy, which is death itself. So since our church is soon to receive its first woman minister, and since the matter of women in ministry is still a point of debate among some churches today, I'll stop here for a moment and explain a little further. <clears throat> Because of the inclusion of women in the ministry of Jesus, and because of their continuing inclusion at Pentecost, and the support for that from the prophecy of Joel that was quoted and emphasized by Peter, Paul later explained it this way as he wrote to the Galatian church. He wrote, So in Christ you are all children of God through faith. For all of you were baptized into Christ and have, been clo and have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male or female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. So we are all spiritual equals at the foot of the cross. This is a powerful and far-reaching principle which should govern the work of the Christian church in all its relationships. Now, other people object and say, well, wait a minute. This same Paul also explicitly refused to allow women in leadership, both in Corinth, when he wrote to that church, and in his writing to Timothy. And that is true in both places. You can look it up. 1 Corinthians 14 and 1 Timothy chapter 2. But the question is, why? I believe there's two reasons, both of which help us to see that these prohibitions were probably specific to the cultural situation he was addressing. First, remember that the churches Paul started in Greece and Asia Minor, the churches of that day contained many Jewish Christians, and they were used to the synagogue where only males were allowed to participate at all. So that norm was pretty firmly established among them. Secondly, the cities in which Paul ministered frequently had temples to pagan goddesses. Remember him talking about Diana and Ephesus? And there was one in Corinth too, I believe. <clears throat> For a church immersed in an idol-worshiping Gentile culture, women church leaders might have been reminiscent of a paganism that the new, church, new Christians were trying to put behind them. So what do we do? When the picture is not quite clear, when we have seemingly conflicts between two point, parts of scripture, we go with the principle rather than the time-bound specific. And the principle is that we are spiritual equals in Christ, okay? And that's why we in Methodism have women ministers. And we're looking forward to uh, Reverend Hall's ministry in the weeks to come. So God's first desire then is to pour out his Holy Spirit on all who are willing, young and old, men and women. And one important corollary, corollary of that is God is able to speak to us through women pastors as well as men, just as Joel prophesied that he would do, and just as Peter affirmed on Pentecost. Now let's move on. Pentecost story also affirms another purpose that God has for us, and we constantly need to be reminded of it. God desires and continues to work 
to call people to repentance. Peter called people to repent. And in fact, 3,000 people were persuaded to follow Jesus that very day. Now, logically, if you're like me, you would like to put this point first. In fact, when I started to write the sermon, that's what I wanted to do. And I started to rearrange the outline, and the Spirit checked me and said, no, don't do it. I was reminded that God did not start with the call. In fact, it's part of the message of Pentecost. He started with the renewing of the church. He started with the empowering of God's people. Remember that even though Jesus had told the disciples already in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, that they were to be his witnesses, what did he do next? He instructed them not to start. He says, you're supposed to be my witnesses, but don't do it yet. Go to the upper room and stay there and wait for something. You need something first. The Holy Spirit. That's right. He told them plainly they needed to wait for the enabling power to come upon them. Friends, much of the reason that the Christian church is so ineffective in calling people to Jesus today is that we usually get right to work first, and then we pray second when our own plan A didn't work. <laughs> yeah? You see, Christians teach and preach and encourage. That's true. And we help try to get other people to follow Jesus. But it's really God who calls people to follow Jesus. And unless God is at work, it just doesn't work. Amen? I remember one of the, we, we used to have a calling uh, ministry, an evangelism explosion calling ministry in my very first church. And we used to teach the, the calling teams, you're looking for where God has been ahead of you. Okay? Uh, one night, one of the ladies uh, took a team of three people. We went out in threes and visited a family who had visited our church several times. And they went to the family, and they did all the things they were supposed to do. And, some, and afterwards, we, had to get, we got together to sort of say what had happened. And, and the leader came back, and she said, oh, she said, I did a terrible job. She said, uh, uh, when it came to the ending part where you were supposed to help people, you know, make a decision, she said, I just, I, I, I messed that all up. So she thought it was a terribly terrible bad appointment but I say that to say this God had gone before her that family came to the Lord through that night never stopped coming to church after that the last I knew the oldest son had become a minister after he went to college okay you just never know because God is the one who calls and that's what we need to remember you see, God does need our faithful witness. But Jesus said, no one can come to me unless the Father draws him. So we need to seek the Holy Spirit's power and guidance first. And then we need to be faithful at the work God gives us to do. He does need us to be reaching out to others and spreading the word. Jesus went about in ministry calling for disciples with simple words like, follow me. He looked for those who needed God. He ate with time collectors and sinners and when they ask him why he said it's not the healthy who need a doctor it's the sick and I have not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance in the upper room after the resurrection Jesus handed that mission over to us and he said as the father has sent me I am sending you so now it's our job to call sinners to repentance to encourage our neighbors and friends and family members to follow Jesus and we are to in the words of the Great Commission make disciples sometimes the missions seem to go well for Jesus and other times it did not and if that was true of him just think about Capernaum what did Jesus say about Capernaum 
he said, I can't do anything in this place. All right? It didn't always go well for Jesus. And if that was true of the master, it will be true of us as well. But Paul said, it is required of those who have been given a trust that they must prove faithful. Amen? So our job is to be faithful together in the task of bringing other people to Jesus. That's our work. Friends, I'm so thankful for your partnership in the gospel for these 10 years. Joanne and I have been so thankful for you all working with us to do the work of the gospel for the last 10 years. We've diligently repaired the house of God. Some of you remember what it was like when we first moved here 10 years ago, the physical house of God. We organized with excitement to celebrate the 200th anniversary of the church back in 2016 and let people know that we um, were not just a historic building, which is what people thought at the time, but we were a vital church continuing to meet the needs of the community. Amen? And by God's grace, we did that. We started new outreach ministries like the booth in Suffield on the Green and the mass Christmas card mailings that we send out every year. We ventured into the 21st century with the church website and the Facebook page and the projection capability in the sanctuary. And when COVID hit, we buckled down to work and started streaming our services online and began receiving online giving. And along the way, God granted us grace to add to the church, both adults and children, including 13 confirmations so far of children that God has given to us. Praise be to God. God has blessed our efforts and granted us strength together to recover from the stresses of the pandemic in a way, by the way, that many churches in NYAC did not. And we could give thanks. Thanks to God for that. But friends, there's much more work to be done. Amen? We all know how fragile the work of God always is. The church is always a generation from extinction. Amen? God doesn't keep grandchildren. He always has children, right? You know what I mean? We don't get to heaven because our parents are children of God. We get to heaven because we are children of God. Amen? That's what I mean. So the church is always only one generation from extinction. So God's work continues. The work of God calling people to himself continues. And the scripture is so true that it says, Don't be deceived. God is not mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. And whoever sows to the Spirit, from the Spirit, will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest, if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. So we continue to work together to make disciples. Finally, and briefly, there's one more thing that God desires to do among us. And it's indicated in the text of Pentecost by what happened in response to the event. As the Holy Spirit was given full sway among the people of God, they came together in unity. You see, God wants to unite people in a devoted church fellowship. Unity in the community of faith produces many beautiful fruits. Worship, spiritual growth, united intercession, shared service to others, and teaching, to name just a few. The emphases of the early church are recorded here in, in the passage that Morgan read so that they can be a model for us. Luke says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, the breaking of bread, and prayer. And these four activities continued to, contributed to their continuing unity. They learned together from the same source, the teaching of the apostles, which for us is scripture. They spent time together in fellowship and met the needs of one another that arose. 
the breaking of bread that's referred to is likely the precursor to the, what we call the sacrament of communion. They were remembering Jesus in the way that he told them to remember him. And they prayed together. So in those four ways, they, they celebrated togetherness. And in those four ways, we still maintain togetherness. God still desires that the people of God be united in their journey of faith. Paul said, make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. There's one body, one spirit just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. So that's the third agenda that God has for his people. He knows that the abundant life that he desires for us happens best when we're functioning together as a unit, following Jesus together. And he knows that when we're working together, we are a powerful lighthouse for him. Amen. Our closing chorus is, Yes, I Will. I invite you to stand if you'd like. I count on one thing, the same God that never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. You're working all things out. Yes, I will. Yes, I will bless your name. Yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Yes, I will. I count on one thing, the same God that never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. You're working all things out. Yes, I Yes, I will bless your name. Yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Yes, I will for all my days. Yes, I will. I choose to Nothing can stand against. I choose to praise, to glorify, glorify the name of all names. That nothing can stand against. Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Yes, I will for all my days. Yes, I will for all my days. Yes, I will.
be seated. Right, we continue to covet your prayers as we plan for a smooth transition into the ministry of our new pastor, Reverend Gia, Reverend Gia Lynn Hall, whose first Sunday with us will be July the 2nd. And uh, they're probably all at, down at Hofstra this weekend. Yours truly decided not to go this year, so I decided to be here instead. <laughs> um, the Higley Village, um, for those of you that don't know, it's the annual conference weekend and it meets on Long Island at Hofstra University usually and this is the first time they've met down there in several years so and usually I, I'm there but this year I decided not to go since it's I didn't really have to be there for next year so the St Higley study group is continuing to meet under the leadership of Reverend Mike Trzinski good to have Mike with us today uh, he lives in Metacomet, and so it's been really good that he's been able to take over the group and continue the ministry that we had there. Uh, we appreciate that. Today is coffee hour. All right. And uh, during coffee hour... <laughs> hey, I'm not alone. Now, Trist yes. Tristan said he was really looking forward to coffee hour, and too. So is Sage. <laughs> And during coffee hour, we will be taking some more pictures of you. If you haven't already sent me a picture, uh, I'd be glad to take your picture today out here in the uh, fellowship hall. And also, I have posted uh, what we have for information for all of you. So if you want to just check and make sure that we have the right phone numbers, whatever you want in there. If you don't want it in there, we won't put it there. Make sure names are spelled right, your kids and everyone. Uh, and it's a work in progress still. It's, it's, I've got a lot to do on it yet. Uh, but we want to get those out to the printer um, sometime this week. So um, I'll be glad to take your pictures. And then also, uh, we've really enjoyed, we've had three open houses so far. Really enjoyed uh, chatting with people. And um, we have one more, so if you didn't make the other three, um, you're, all the rest of you are invited uh, Friday, June 16th at, from 6.30 to 8.30. And even if you can't make that, you know, we'll get together sometime. Don't worry about it. <laughs> so, looking forward to that. Today is uh, Jake Oliver's birthday. We wish him a happy birthday. And Judy's birthday is on the 16th, so she'll be back for her birthday. And coming up this week, we have our annual UMW dinner for all the ladies at J&G's, 6 p.m. And then uh, the 14th is an SPPR meeting at 7 in North Canton. We've got a lot going on this week. <laughs> the 15th is a cooperative parish meeting at 7 in North Canton. Uh, June 20th, council at 6.30. That's Thursday. And then the 24th, I hear there's going to be an open house here at the church from noon to 4. So um, look forward to seeing you all then. I guess it's like a drop-in. You just come whenever you want to between that time. Okay, that's great. And, you know, you all keep saying we're going to miss you. Well, there's only two of us, but there's a lot of you that we're going to miss. So that's right. we got a lot more missing than you. <laughs> but, um, but um, you know, just... I, just to remember, you know, how, as Pastor was saying, how we've grown and how each one of us has matured spiritually and how we're going to move forward. You know, we use what God gives us, and God's got a plan. And we'd be surprised and excited, I think, if we knew what it is. So we're going to go Amen. for it, right? Amen. Move forward with, with God. Uh, then... Boy, got a lot of dates there. These, by the way, these are all on a little sheet in case you forget. Did you all they're, get one uh, from Michael in, on the way in? They're in the back, so these are all written down for you. June 25th is Pastor's last service here, and then Ju July 2nd, Pastor Gia Hall will be here. And by the way, I thought what um, Pastor said about women in ministry, that that is so true. I just love the way he explained it. Uh, and, you know, in the Wesleyan Church, where we come from, Back in the 1900s, there were a lot of women pastors. 
So some of them co-pastored, so, and they did great work for God, so it's a fact. So, but, you know, all of, all of you women here, even though you're not, you know, up teaching or up front, you still have a ministry. It doesn't have to be as a preacher. You know, a lot of you are ministers as moms. That's big ministry right there. Amen. So, okay, I'm done preaching. All right. <laughs> Her father was a preacher. You just, it, it gets in the blood, you know. Thank you for your financial generosity to our church this week. And you can continue to support God's work here, either by a recurring gift or a one-time gift using the donate button on our website, www.copperhillchurch.us. Or you can text your gift to 860-579-6338. And you can place your gift in the giving box at the rear of the church, or you can mail it to Box 422 East Granby, Connecticut, 06026. We really appreciate all of you who watch online, as well as all of you who are here this morning. Let's rejoice together and invite you to stand as we close our service and sing the doxology and praise to God. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him, all above heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son. Lord, we thank you for your, for your goodness to us in so many ways and for the generosity of Jesus to us by his grace that never ends. Thank you for teaching us generosity after you. And we thank you for all those who have been generous to the church this, this week. May their gifts be blessed and may they be blessed through Jesus Christ our Lord in whose name we pray. Amen. I invite you to participate in our closing prayer. As soon as it comes up for you, there we go. Our Heavenly Father, help us to grow in the grace, knowledge, and love of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.